interesting in many ways. One alternative here is that you will walk away and have seen interesting things. And the other alternative is that you will walk away and feeling, God, I'm glad I'm not Staffan. <laughs> because uh, I'm going to do a lot of things that everybody says that you shouldn't do on a demonstration. There's a lot of moving parts. And uh, yeah, it can turn out either way. But let's go. So uh, this session came to live after I was reading some issues on the GitHub repo on performance issue on import CSV. Somebody complained that it was slow, and I thought, well, let's have a look at it. And then I kind of got hooked and started looking at uh, the JSON stuff that underlies both convert from JSON and invoke REST method that converts JSON into PS objects. And I'm going to today try to walk you through the steps uh, that I took in pinpointing issues in the code in JSON object.cs in the, uh, it's on the, the GitHub repository. You can have a look at it. It's no magic. And see the iterative process of finding memory allocations that were unnecessary. Changing the code to remove, remove these, measure again, find the next offender, and iterate on it. So we're going to look at a memory profiler, and we're going to look at some common patterns that show up over and over again when you are optimizing code. Bad patterns that are really easy to make. It doesn't look bad, but when you measure it, it becomes really clear that this wasn't a good idea. And again, show that like this isn't that hard. It's not super easy, but it's, it's definitely like, reachable. And you can do it even to see where you do stuff that is, is uh, non-optimal in the PowerShell code. I'm going to start with a short uh, background on like, memory basics, since that is what this, is, this talk is all about, and try to get some common vocabularies. Some do's and don'ts, and then this case study, which hopefully will be the biggest part of the talk. Uh, and it's not the dot trace profiler, it's dot memory, but that's... So, heap and stack are two central things when you talk about memory in a computer. The stack is handled by the language. It automatically stores local variables in functions and parameters that are passed into functions. It's usually small in, like, think a megabyte, as compared to the heap that can be as, as large as your virtual memory. The heap was traditionally completely managed by the programmers and still are in languages like C++. Uh, but with garbage collecting environments that PowerShell runs in, the deallocation, like the returning of memory to the system, is handled by uh, the common language runtime. But the programmer is still responsible for allocating memory there. And you, you will see it by calling a new in PowerShell or new object or alloc in some languages or malloc. The stack that's managed by the language is just a register pointer saying where in, in memory do I start allocating. It can only grow when you call a function. It, it expands the stack, and as soon as you return from that function, it's, it's uh, returned, it's deallocated. It's not in use anymore. The heap needs to explicitly return stuff to it. And this can lead to fragmentation, that you allocate different sized objects, and then you return them in different order, which can lead to holes in the heap. When I started doing server-side programming, this was a huge problem for long-running software, because you could, you could have a lot of, of memory, but you had no memory left that was appropriately sized. The holes were too small because of the fragmentation. And garbage collection can solve this, and I, we will look a little bit on how that can look. We have one thread per 
uh, one stack per thread. So if you have 20 threads, you have 20 stacks. And if you run out of stack, you crash. Uh, often terminating the whole process. And the heap, you usually have one heap per process, but you can, uh, in advanced cases, allocate more heaps. The stack most often contains pointers into the objects you have allocated on the heap. And this is something that the garbage collector is very interested in when it tries to find garbage, memory that isn't any longer referenced by anything on the stack. So we're going to look at this before a small program start. Uh, the code is in C sharp. It's a main function that is called when you start a program. It takes a string array as arguments. And before the program starts, uh, the operating creates a thread with a stack. We get the arguments pushed on the stack, and it points. Can you see my? It points to the string array at the bottom of the heap. That string array has a single member to the only argument that was passed, a string containing my name. So when we run this, uh, we save the address now. You see the first line here? We assign the first argument to, to name. The stack gets this reference. And it also points directly to the string, my name. Then we create the program. The program itself has a member name, which points to this string in memory. Uh, and this is how, when you allocate memory, you fill up the heap. It grows upwards to higher memories. The stack grows in the other direction for some, to me, unknown reason. If any old timer know why that decision was made, I would be interesting to hear it. So now we're going to look at what will happen when we allocate memory in a loop. So we have some reader of some sort that reads a line. We have the line on the stack pointing to the string that was allocated by the reader. Then we call line.split. Line.split, a string.split, creates an array with the different parts of the string that we want to split on. So that created one object that was the array that contained position to, to references to the actual strings that we have created. We process those parts, and parts go out of scope. So we have nothing left referencing the string array and the strings. They are now considered garbage. So we loop again. We read the new line. We split it. And we process it. Parts goes out of scope. And we have more garbage. And this is where the garbage collector really comes in to help us. So I want to allocate again, but I have no more space to allocate from. So the garbage collector kicks in, and it finds roots. Roots are locations on the stack that contains pointers into the heap. Roots can also be static variables of classes, because they also keep the reference to memory alive. We mark the objects that are reachable from those roots. That's the orange strings. There's still a reference here. Then we clear out the garbage, and then something really cool happens. We move the objects in memory, compacting in, compacting it. So we don't get the fragments. Now I can allocate a big object again, and it will always 
fit, because all my available memory is consecutive. And we update all the reference that pointed to this moved memory so that, that they now point to the new location. This is super convenient, but you can also imagine that it, it doesn't come for free. So this is like the underlying mechanisms uh, that are going on, and I try to explain why garbage collection can be expensive and why we need to try to avoid creating garbage. That means trying to allocate less. So advantages of having garbage collection. As you saw, it, it helps us managing memory. We always have uh, available memory if, if we don't make stupid mistakes. It enables things like the common language runtime to create a safe system where we don't you, you get like a, a constraining jacket on programmers, and, and programmers need that. As I said, you can't trust programmers. Trust me. Yeah, and I, I actually state performance as an advantage here, because super competent world-class programmers can craft more efficient programs in native code like C and C++. But the 95% of us can't. And in those cases, garbage collection is a win every time. Disadvantages with garbage collection is that it, it makes memory management so easy, that it's easy to forget those costs, leading us to write suboptimal code. You have less control of when memory is reclaimed, and it can lead to performance issues when you allocate more because of the, the, the above. So performance is complicated. Before we dive into this actual case study, I'm going to give you a few heads up. When you look at the code, try to see if you can spot any of these things like that we are about to fix. Resizing containers. Containers that's like hash tables and lists. And when you create a hash table or a list by default, it's very small. And when you keep adding to it, it ends up to, it comes to a point where you no longer have any space. So then the containers are really helpful. They allocate more space and copies the objects into this new space. And the garbage collection kicks in and eventually and removes uh, the old garbage. And we keep adding and reach the, the limit again, and the process happens over again. So one thing we can do uh, is start out by saying, I know I'm gonna use at least this much. Allocate that much memory uh, at the start. And the, the, there's huge saves in that. Parsing strings are expensive. We need to do it, but uh, with .NET 3.0 that's coming in the new PowerShell, we have in the C-sharp language underlying the PowerShell, we have bet better primitives with a new class called span. Enumerations for each may be more expensive than you think. It depends on the collection. Sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's less so. In C Sharp, there's a really convenient thing optimized for programmer productivity called a params argument. It's, it says that, like this method can take any number of integers. So I don't have to create different overloads for one, two, three, four integers. But underlying it, it's less efficient. And a third thing is, I run into this a couple of times, that you see a subsystem designed for one thing, somebody else walks up to the subsystem, they need to get their task done. And there is a way to do it using the subsystem, but it's horribly inefficient. And instead of 
like looking at that and understanding that, people go about their business and, and make it work. And oftentimes fixing the subsystem to support this other scenario isn't that difficult. So, concretely, pass in a capacity to a collection when you construct it. Now I can add 100 items, 100 integers to this collection without reallocating anything. The params uh, providing an overload with an explicit number of parameters for a hotspot case <coughs> makes this really cheap as what the compiler actually does when you call a params method is that it creates an array, populates the array with the arguments, pass it to the function, and then the garbage collect collector have to collect the array. This is a, the new way of parsing strings that is much more efficient, uh, that we are starting to use more and more in the engine. Well, that's about it, about it. So now into uh, the actual case study. We're going to look at uh, Convert from JSON. We're going to try to understand where the problem lies by using this profiler, .memory from JetBrains. I love their tools. They have one drawback, and that is that you can't resize the fonts. You guys in the back, good luck. I will try to uh, magnify stuff. Uh, remind me if I don't. We're going to look to find the worst offender. Then use uh, Visual Studio to fix it. And while we're not happy and still have time, we profile and remove the worst offender. And I'm going to see if I can get to. So we're going back in time now to how the PowerShell, PowerShell repository looked before I started doing these fixes. So we're in the PowerShell repository. We're importing the build module and called start ps build. This is like when you work on, on the PowerShell source code, these are the steps you take. So we've got ourselves a newly built PowerShell, and I've launched .memory, the profiler that we're going to uh, use. I've pointed it to, and this is probably one of these cases where yeah, you see it, I don't. Uh, we're going to uh, call this file memjson.ps1 on the newly built PowerShell. And that file, the only thing it does, it creates, I have a function, uh, get me some JSON data, and I can pass in how much data I want. And the interesting thing that we are, are calling is convert from JSON. And then I just have some, some timing code around this. So when we run, we get this profiling view. And you can see how it allocates memory. Uh, first, I got a peek when we read in the string and created all the JSON objects. And now we are converting JSON objects to PowerShell objects. Can you see the, the jagged uh, blue? That's the generation zero, the short-lived memory uh, objects that the garbage collector keeps collecting. The red are those objects that survived the first collection. Uh, they are promoted to a new generation that will get checked less often, and those that outlive those 
get promoted to the second generation, which are checked even less often. This is an optimization by the garbage collector. The green that you see is the second generation, and red is the first and blue is the, the generation zero, the ephemerals. So now I'm clicking on a link called view memory traffic. So I'm comparing here the first and the second snapshots, and I want to see what kinds of objects has been allocated. Hash table buckets, well, we have allocated some 36 megabytes. And if I go down to see where did these allocations come from, I see hash table rehash. And that's when my like spider, spider sense starts to tingle. Rehash happens when I've run out of space in a hash table, I need to resize it and recompute uh, where the different hash objects are placed, hashed objects. So where did this come from? It was called from hash table insert, which was called from order dictionary add, pem, ps. Now we're into the underpinnings of ps object, it, the collections that ps object are using. Get integrated, we have some enumeration, oh, oh, oh. Enumerable any that is called from populate from JSON dictionary. Okay, now we're in the code. Populate from JSON dictionary, that's where we make a PowerShell object into, or a JSON object into a PowerShell object. So here's something that is definitely sus suspect. So I'm going into Visual Studio, into the method populate from J dictionary. It helps me here. And if we look what it's doing, so we're, we're creating a new PS object. We're looping through entries in JObject, which I just assume it's the properties. And we do some error checking. We check that we have no duplicate members. And here I see properties Annie. Annie was the call I saw in the profiler that enumerates this collection. And I know that PowerShell is decently fast at accessing a property that you have given it a name for. But enumerating all properties is not one of the use cases uh, where it's fast. So this needs to change. We, we can't, we could rewrite PS object, but uh, like that wasn't what I had in mind. Uh, I have it in mind, but not for this. <laughs> so I, I need to do this in some other way. So I wish that I had instead a member tracker. Let's say that we get it as a parameter. Duplicate member tracker, member tracker. Now it complains that we don't have such a class. By having resharper, so I ask it to create it. I get a class, and I use a hash set, set of strings to keep track of this. And I give it a constructor that says, that it can take a capacity. Because you now know that when you use uh, collections, you want to be able to give them a capacity up front. So I pass this capacity to the hash set, and I tell it also that we want to compare the strings here in the same way as PowerShell does in its member collection. So now that, now that we are able to track duplicate members, which was what the error checking code was doing. Uh, here. We, 
we can ask the member tracker to try to get this value. And if, like, please don't tell anybody outside of this room that I used the out var because the guys who are managing the coding standards at the PowerShell repository will not be happy with me. They think it's less readable. And I also want to check now that this, this uh, the same way as they did before, that if this equals uh, the key, but in a case-sensitive way, I've just, the, what I've done here, I've just replaced the slow subsystem with a custom thing. And now I need to, to try to fix up the errors. I need to pass it in a new member tracker. And I know that this needs to be the size of the, J, uh, the JSON object that I'm... I know how many entries it had. So I, I can resize this container up front. These are the same things, uh, but obviously with a different variable name and the last place. You can see the red squiggly. Okay, so now we fix the code and we do this dance again. We import, yeah. So compiling the code, uh, what, there's a nifty thing when you're, you, now I'm using uh, a source file that is outside of the core engine. Uh, the build script actually have a, a switch parameter that only builds the engine, which makes it much, much faster than, than this if you, if you know that you're only working on that, but I can't use it, unfortunately. So uh, I run the profiler again. I get the snapshot, and can you see now that we have a complete, completely different, do you see all this, the jaggedness is no longer there. And did you also notice that it ran much faster? So we look at the memory traffic again. Still hash table bucket, didn't we fix that? but a lot less allocated memory. I'm looking again, we have some rehashing, but now it's not from the enumerable. Add to type XML cache. Okay, I need to do some debugging and I've done it. It's when you add a property to a PS object. And when we look at it, I don't know if you remember up front when I said that we're, ah, we're gonna wait for Visual Studio again here. PS object. What if I, from the beginning, say that I need this many the size for this many properties, so that when when we add the properties to PS object, it already has allocated memory for it. We do the dance again, and this is when you find your send mode, like when you do, do performance optimization, a lot of time is waiting for builds. Uh, when you first adapt to dig into the code, have you tried to make a compiler that in the documentations before you actually started to change the code? In a code base that is mature, that has been developed by professional developers for decades, 
the chance that I would do magic by fiddling with compiler flag is very low. Uh, and the CLR, the, it doesn't have, like, you tell it to optimize, and then it's, you, you only produce intermediate language. Oh, that, sorry, we, we'll take that offline. It's a good question, but find me afterwards. So, yet again, we're profiling. We're creating the JSON objects in the beginning here. I get my snapshots. How are we on time? Um, I think we have seven minutes. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. So I'm viewing this again, and now I'm starting to like, okay, there's the top PS node property. That is what keeps the key and the name and the actual value of a property on a PowerShell object. So that's, I'm completely happy with, with us creating those. That's expected. J property, that's something from Newton's of JSON. That's also completely expected that they would allocate strings, of course, J value. We allocate hash buckets, but when I look at the, at the constructor, it uses the constructor that passes a capacity. That's not low hanging fruit. It's al already doing the right thing. So I keep going down this. Now you can see I can go fairly object. This is interesting. Set capacity. List.set capacity. That's happening when you resize a list. So where did this come from? Populate from J array. This is in our code. Populate from J array resize a list. So we go to populate from J array. <laughs> and what is the first thing you see? Did you recognize this? Yeah, what should you do? Pass a capacity. Do you know the capacity, do you think? But, okay, so, so I read the code and see, we loop through this, we add the results, and then we call to, to array, okay? So we're gonna create an object array, but we use a list to do it. That's yet another extra location, so I just, I just scrap the array and say var and new New object array that uh, is sized by the count. And I need an index to be able to iterate uh, or know where to insert stuff. So I change this to for loop. You just love resharper when you do things like this. So I just ask it to, to make this iteration an array or a for loop instead of for each. And then I get some errors. So I need to say that result of index equals this. And then, then I ask resharper to remove the redundant parenthesis and go to the next error where I can replace this and remove the redundancies. And in the end, we have this two array. We already have an array, so this is just meaningless. And now you're starting to see the flow here. We find the hotspot. We look at the code. Now, this looking at code uh, was quite a lot faster than when I did this initially, because uh, Quite often you need to step through the code and understand like what is happening and the changes you make you have to Think through more than it seems like I did now uh, But in the interest of time here So 
So we run the profiler again. And I get the snapshot after the JSON stuff, just to be, I'm only interested in, interested in our conversion to PS object, which is between the snapshots. That all, I know that, but that's, that wasn't at all obvious to you. Uh, th that's one of the things when you start working on a new area, you have to figure out how do I write the, the test code so I can uh, get decent snapshots. And now I think I've got help from Windows Defender. Uh, so let's run this again, because it determined that I, I was writing a virus. And you see now that the time it takes every time is shorter and shorter, shorter and shorter. And we have vastly less allocations or garbage collections. These are usually the same things. And we look at the traffic again. Now I really have to go down these objects. This is, you know, this is the constructor where we already pass a capacity. And populate from J array, yeah, that, like, we have a list of T, but this is from the language infrastructure, okay. Now that looks good. I, yeah, I have this duplicate member tracker that we wrote. Am I doing something stupid with that? Com populate from J array. Okay, so I'm, I'm allocating a new member tracker in a loop. Maybe if I had a function that could give me, this is something that I, I kind of like to use, wishful thinking programming. Like what if I had a duplicate member tracker uh, that took a capacity And then we need some actual member to keep this. Uh, this is a, an inner function. It's a function within a function. And th th then it gets access to, to, to these local variables. So if this is, uh, if it's now, I, uh, Or otherwise, I clear it. And ensure that we have the capacity we need. So then I only need to resize it. Uh, and in the end, we need to return the member tracker. Yeah, it complain power sh or resharper is so helpful. It, it it tells me you have to uh, initialize that variable there. Otherwise, uh, something like this, and then we run again. So that that ensures that I only allocated this on the top of the uh, loop, and if needed. Uh, raise the capacity. Isn't it wonderful that we have a, a scripting language that we can use to automate presentations? <laughs> so this is the last one. I don't need to show the, the unmanaged memory. I get the snapshot.
And now I'm actually at the stage that I was, you know, you remember the loop, the, the while not happy uh, profile and fix the worst offenders? <laughs> this is actually where I'm at a place that I go down this list of allocations and I, I don't, there's nothing popping out. But like the low hanging fruits are, are fixed. So um, let's have a shootout between the different versions, before the fix and after the fix. So for, uh, I'm being tricked a bit here about there, maybe. Do you see it now? So I just create the same function that we use to run the profiler. And I'm first running on, on a thousand objects. It took 1.26 seconds and only 0 0.26 seconds on the second. Then we run it on 20,000. And you see we're four times faster. Four times faster, not 40%. And uh, when the data set gets larger, it, it actually, I'm, I haven't looked into really why, but it, it gets even better with larger objects. So, so I guess, oh, I shouldn't speculate, you shouldn't, like the first rules of, the first three rules of performance optimizations, do you know them? First is measure. Second, measure. And third is measure. You, you can't guess where the problems are. The, the code that we looked at, it looked perfect, perfectly reasonable. There was nothing in this code that popped out as, as stupid. I created a PS object, I looked through, I added the properties. Everything was like, it looked good. I, I wouldn't have spotted these things uh, without the profiler. And you see the old, before the fix, it's still, still running. And this is the code that is the underpinnings on both convert from JSON and invoke rest method. So I was actually really pleased when, when I started looking at this and, and, and saw like, wow, did it make that big a difference? So it can be extremely rewarding to do this kind of work. And it, like when the combination of time and inspiration hits at the same time, often like after like 7.30 7 in the evening, uh, when the kids' cages are already locked. Uh, <laughs> and you sit down, may maybe with a, like a smoky scotch uh, and a profiler, <laughs> and everything is just, yeah. Hey, you can see this second run we were four, uh, five times faster instead. So that, that is, um, let's see here. I'm duplicating, right? This isn't anything important. This is the summary slide that doesn't really say anything. But I have no clue. So maybe we can... Yo! Yeah! So, to summarize, garbage collection helps us. As programmers, it's super convenient. It helps to hide the kind of stuff that we saw today. But using profilers, we can quite easily find these offenders. And once you start to see this over and over again, I quite easily now spot things that are like, oh, here they're creating a collection, they didn't pass a capacity. Why? Sometimes you don't know the, the initial size, but sometimes you can have a good guesstimate. Use that instead to, to start with zero. And it's an iterative process.
and not rocket science. You, do, you don't have to be smart to do this. <laughs> like, look at <laughs> it. Uh, yeah. On time. Hit me. Formatting subsystem. The, uh, the question is, uh, have I been looking at other pieces of the code where I've seen similar patterns, similar... Uh, the formatting subsystem did exactly the same thing that we saw with uh, PS object properties any. Find me... Uh, they were looking for some, some properties that were only adding, added when the remoting uh, systems propagate some information. And the formatting system tried to see, am I an integer or something that doesn't have any properties? Then I should treat it differently. And, and to do that, we queried the objects for every member it had. And that is expensive uh, on PS objects because it actually makes a copy of the collection of all its properties. So we got like a 10 times speed up on the on the formatting system by fixing things like this. So that's a, a hobby of mine, when uh, time and inspiration occurs at the same time. Yeah. I don't have anything else for you if you don't have any questions, but feel, feel free to just uh, grab me outside, buy me a coffee. So, oh, thanks for coming.